Good morning, everyone. Give me just a moment to get everybody in from the waiting room and we'll get going. All right, thank you for joining me. Let me get our screen share started. Okay, looks like we have our teammate. Let me get Julia made the co-presenter and then we will actually get started. Bear with me, we're jumping from one thing to the next this week. There we go. Okay, now we have technology under control. Thank you for your patience this morning. All right. Let's see, Cassie, I can see your face. Can you hear me this morning? All right, perfect. Just wanted to make sure. I was having some audio problems yesterday because I've been off site, so I just wanted to double check. So thank you everyone for joining us for session 41 of our mentor webinars and our first one for the school year. This is our agenda for today. As usual, I will start with a quick mindfulness moment and then introduce our presenters. Uh, we'll be hearing from Cassie Hayes on parent and family engagement, and then Scott Iyer with relationship advice embodying the role of a mentor. So this morning for our mindfulness moment, I thought it would just be nice to start off if we all shared in the chat some highlights of some connects we've already had this school year. Um, perhaps with a student, or for me, it would probably be connecting with our new mentors. But if there's a highlight or something you'd like to share with everybody, I'd love for us to take a moment and do that. And while I while we do that, I'm going to continue getting folks in from the waiting room. Okay. Looks like we have most everyone in from the waiting room at this point. So let me hop over to the chat and see what you all have shared so far. All right. So Cassie has been connecting with students coming from out of the country. How exciting to get them settled into their new place with new schools and new people. That's wonderful. Let's see, Carolyn's group had a birthday celebration last week for one of the students in the behavior unit, and she was truly grateful that it made her birthday special. Oh, birthdays are so important. I'm so happy to hear you were able to celebrate with her, Carolyn. All right, friends, so if there's anything else you'd like to share in the chat as we're going, I'd love to hear about it. We always need to refill our cups. All right, looks like Ashley was able to connect with elementary student who was so excited just to be there, or yeah, just there to see them by themselves. Oh, I love it. One-on-one -on -one time is ever so important for all of us. Absolutely. All right, well, we've got one more friend in the waiting room. Let me get there we go. And Kelly has met with most of her kiddos so far. Congrats, Kelly. That's awesome for the first of the school year. And finally been able to make connection with one that's been hard to get to. And she's doing great so far this school year. That's fantastic news. Matt, who's our mentor down in San Juan, has connected with about 10 students so far. And his highlight is a fourth grader who gets excited every time. And Matt is his friend. That is just lovely. Uh, looks like Julieta was able to celebrate some birthdays and she attended some child and family team meetings this summer, which is such an awesome way to stay connected with your kiddos. Oh, I love this. What a great way to start the webinar. All right. Looks like we had uh, Annie and Iron has two new brothers that she's taking care of birthdays as well with an in-home visit. Ugh. And you're getting your family engagement to boot, Annie. I love it. 
All right, friends. Well, thank you for sharing. I'll continue reading those as we're going, but let me go ahead and get Cassie introduced and then Scott so we can have them start sharing. So Cassie recently joined USBE as the parent liaison and engagement specialist, and she has over 27 years of experience in education and a master's in educational leadership. During the time she taught in the classroom, she ran online learning programs for seven years, as well as directed a K through 12 charter for nine years. She is passionate about education and the real importance of authentic parent engagement in public education, especially during this era of competitive market-driven approaches, which impact districts and charter schools. Cassie's position is to assist parents with policy, legislation, respond to questions, provide resources, and, oh, excuse me, as well as rights and education at all levels. She also provides local school districts and charter school staff with effective research-based practices, training, strategies, and materials for authentic system, or excuse me, systematic parent engagement. She looks forward to collaborating with various groups and individuals who are working to better the public education students for their families in any aspect. We welcome Cammy, or yes, Kathy to the team and look forward to hearing her presentation next. But before that, let me introduce Scott. Uh, some of you have seen him before. He's coming back again to share today. And Scott serves at the State Board as a school-based mental health specialist. And he also works for the Department of Education Human Resources, Office of Substance Use and Mental Health, as a member of the Education Advisory Board to the State Security Chief. His email address signature has got to be a mile long. Anyway, Scott's career spans over two decades of working with youth and families and programs in both public and private sectors. He earned his bachelor's in psychology from Utah Valley University and a master's in clinical social work from University of Utah. And we'll hear from Scott second. So with that, let me go ahead and remind myself, Cassie, were you going to share slides or am I going to do it for you? I was going to have you do it, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Give me just one moment to get those open. And then I will share again. Okay. There we go. And then we got to play the which screen is it on game. So, all right, Cassie, was there any sound in your presentation? No. Uh -uh. Oh, I realized I forgot to click the extra <laughs> box, so I just wanted to. No double. worries. All right. Well, well, excellent. Okay, we'll take we it. We won't over. make it. We won't make it harder than it already is. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go over some things that um, I do. First of all, this um, position, so you can go to the next slide, the, this position is actually created out of 2023's legislative session, which um, was sort of out of a need from parents um, reaching out to legislators needing um, assistance. And so uh, my job is basically dictated out in law. So if you ever want to know exactly what my job is, it's it's there. And um, if you want to go to the next slide, one of my main um, position um, responsibilities is to do conflict resolution to the best of my ability. <laughs> Um, I get a lot of phone calls and I work very closely with internal audit um, on their complaint line and I will get referrals from parents. And in all honesty, most of what I will initially uh, do is try to reach out to the parent and find out what their communication has been with the LEA. And I really do try to make sure that it's gone back to the LEA first as a concern and um, it's addressing their, the correct parties and you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, imagine how how many parents just don't know how to go about that or who they should talk to, um, what their rights are. So I I provide a lot of that information. Um, I also do homeschool and Utah Fits All Scholarship. That's not actually in my job description, but I do it because I have a lot of experience with it. 
And I also, um, they're just in their nature, the homeschool population and um, Utah fits all. There are a lot of questions, uh, especially, you know, like what their rights are and what to do, those kinds of things. So I, I take care of those two things as well. I don't run Utah fits all scholarship. Let me make that clear. There's a, there's an agency outside of uh, USBE that um, administers that program. So I work closely with them and parents to navigate that system. And if you wanna do the next one, um, I also um, I also run a page if you ever are needing things. Um, and I'm, I, it's always evolving. It's, it's like this dynamic, actually I have two pages. I have one um, page that has parent engagement for LEAs across the state. And this is where I share research. I try and get, keep the, the most current research on parent engagement and the most current practices um, on how to effectively engage uh, parents and families. Um, we all know that parent engagement is definitely not a one size um, fits all type of uh, situation. So I try to make sure that I can help LEAs with um different practices that might, you know, work specifically for their demographic, or maybe they have certain families that there are unique needs for whatever. Um, and honestly, LEAs will reach out to me sometimes like the parents do. They, they just, and that is part of my job, even though my title is parent liaison and parent engagement, I am also, um, in law. It's, I'm supposed to help LEAs find that research, find best practices, figure out how to utilize those. I And I try really hard to identify places in the state of Utah where those practices are happening and they're happening successfully so that they can see those things happening in real time and be able, you know, because it's just kind of more comfortable to see someone that's already doing it and see how they've done it and what um, hurdles they've gone through. I'm... I'm extremely passionate about trying to make um, parent engagement more systemic so that it's not just because right now it's prevalent in Title I and special education, but that's because it's dictated in law that way. So I would really like to see it become more systemic, especially in this um, current time of, uh, you know, there's there's just more school choice and I do think that it will become a bit more market driven and um, parents will, uh, well, then, you know, there's a decline in enrollment across the nation. So I'm super passionate about trying to make parent engagement more systemic for the benefit of public ed, as well as the families that are um, enrolled in public education. So that's um, a big thing for me right now. It's one of my um, goals is to try and, uh, make that more, you know, system-wide instead of just in pro program related. I also try to provide some professional learning. I do go to different districts and stuff, and I will do some trainings and things. I don't do a lot of really specific like home visit training and I can get that, but there are actually some other people in the special education department that are uh, very proficient in that. And so it's, um, I would have them, and they also already do that a lot for Title I in special ed. So I do try to encourage a lot of ongoing professional learning for teachers, school leaders, and with those with those um, frameworks, because if that's not ongoing, I feel like it sort of, you know, falls by the wayside. If you want to go to the next one, um, let's see trying really hard to promote parents. This is one of my things. I I have a um a bit of an issue with the word transparency and and authenticity. Those words get thrown around a lot and I feel like uh it's super important to to really adhere to those and and truly be transparent with parents and also try to be authentic in involving them in the process of their child's education in a in a way that's more not just involvement, you know, like 
bake sales and book fairs and things like that, but where they are coming in and actually getting to help make decisions about what is best for their child because they know their child. So I'm very passionate about that as well. Um, I, tr I, I collaborate with a lot of different um, USB t B teams um, to ensure that those um, strategies are kind of happening. <laughs> I'm not going to lie because we work a lot off site. It's hard sometimes to connect with all of those teams because you don't really see the people as much anymore. And sometimes we're all doing some component of parent engagement and trying to get all of those kind of knitted together and collaborated is, is a little bit of a feat because the agency is so big. As well as, you know, throughout the state of Utah, just trying to identify effective um, parent engagement programs is kind of um, quite a feat. Um, let's see, maybe go to the next one. And as I stated, you know, just trying to um, systematize those uh, things and then even trying to work with um, legislators and board leadership to talk about, you know, ideas that possibly for funding and things for LEAs to sponsor parent engagement. There's a lot of different ideas being thrown around. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so that link down there is for parent engagement for LEAs. That's what the, the practices, best practices for LEAs. But <clears throat> I would like to just quickly mention that I also have and run the parent um, portal, which has resources for parents. Um, there's, oh my goodness, that that page is huge and it has a lot of resources. And I, I do try to go through the entire agency's website because it um, is kind of catered towards LEAs. So it's super hard for parents to understand, especially all the acronyms. There are so many acronyms out there. <laughs> And um, they don't know, you know, what is an LEA? What, you know, what are, what is even USBE? You know, and you'll say, I work for USBE. Well, what is that? They don't know all of these things. So I try to make sure that I can help navigate that and sort of look at it from their perspective and then put that information on that page. So that parent portal has a lot of information. It's a little bit of um, a challenge to keep that super current, especially during legislative session and make sure everything is accurate after we go through legislative session. But so I do have those pages. I have um, the parent portal and you can see that right when you get onto the Utah State Board of Education website, right at the top on the right hand um, side, they've made that extremely visible. And then I also have the parent engagement for LEAs. We're also working on, I'm working with some different departments to try and create even some educational resources for parents, especially for them to utilize at home. So parents have some resources to help their child directly with, you know, reading and math. That's where we're starting right now. And so that's going to be kind of fun and exciting and great resource for parents. And I don't know, Amanda, if you have that last slide on there for some reason. Um, I also help with military families. Oh, yeah, there it is. And um, yeah, so and, and Ben Rasmussen um, works with those people as well. So I've been collaborating with him on that. So that's sort of my job in a nutshell. And um, I would just like to say a couple of things beyond that. And then I would really like to get your feedback and information on what you see as needs, because that's one of my uh, big um, endeavors is to try and get information from other agencies to see where I can help uh navigate, you know, the collaboration between different agencies, different departments, and where you see um, some gaps and things. So I, I love this one quote, and I think it could be altered a bit. Um, it's by uh, Steve, I can't even say his name very well, Constantino, Constantino. 
Um, he says family engagement is not an initiative, nor is it a race. Family engagement is a commitment to change school culture and as such is ongoing and never ending. And I truly believe that it can't just be a, um, a check off the box type of situation. Um, you know, when you talk to different LEAs and you say, what have you got in place for parent engagement? The answers vary tremendously. So we have things that are, yeah, we've got parent engagement, but it will be something that's basically, like I said, you know, a, a book fair situation or, but it's, and I'm not going to lie, it's very difficult to implement a parent, a really authentic, um, super high engage, engaging, you know, family and parent engagement program. It's, it's, it's a big mountain to climb and it does take a long time. So there are a few things that I personally feel like are, and, and there's so many studies out there and there's so many people saying, this is the way it should be done. This is the way it should be done. And I just think it really is dependent upon the demographic you're working with. However, there are some uh, things that I think are extremely important to, that are just foundational. Um, obviously, one is communication. And one of the big hurdles that we find is accessibility for communication, because there are some families out there that all they have is their phone, if we're lucky, you know, so we don't always see engagement in demographics that don't have access to technology. Um, just simply holding meetings at different times. There's a lot of family, there are a lot of families that are underrepresented because they are doing shift work, for instance. How do you get their feedback? And I talked to trust lands even about this with their community councils. How do you get parents from the entire demographic involved um, when they don't have access to technology or they have a language barrier? And we're seeing that on a prevalent scale. It's one thing if it's a common language, but we have some languages and even situations in districts that I've talked to that have families moving in in droves and they don't even read their own language. So, you know, where you can't just send them an email. <laughs> that's that's not, you know, going to be a best practice for that family. So accessibility is a huge thing for parents so that they feel like they um, have access to the information. The other one is inclusion and parents fe feeling welcome, being able to be adaptable for parents, which kind of goes to the accessibility in a way, having constructive dialogue. Um, I will say one of my things is, is for people to not take things personally, <laughs> I think, I'm so kind of um, easygoing, but a lot of people tend to take things personally when people say that and I or say something. And then I, I'm always like, you know, this is not about you. You know, it is not about me. This is about the goal is to help these parents feel included and um, be able to take uh, part in this process. And um, I think traditionally it's kind of been I'm just being very transparent, sort of an us versus them situation. And I would love for that to uh, dissipate. I think it's getting better for sure. I think people are starting to have more constructive conversations and that is a big hurdle. I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that I'm finding is uh, just the way education has been traditionally. It's kind of like, here's my child. And then, you know, the parent just gets the report card, goes to the um, parent-teacher conferences and those kinds of things. So I would love to see th th there be more of a back and forth dialogue. Sometimes that honestly boils down to the accessibility option, though, and, you know, finding ways to communicate. And some schools have done a really good job with that by implementing platforms that are conducive to having that back and forth dialogue. And one of the most effective ways is literally just texting them, you know, having teachers encouraging them to take and and literally schedule in and and it's um, it goes to leadership, you know, to pr help provide that time for parents to reach out to their uh, parents, at, you know, on a regular basis so that the parent knows and and 
giving them authentic feedback on their child. That's a huge, like if we could just get everyone to do that, that would be amazing. Just that one thing. Um, trust and authenticity and having the parent feel like they are being seen and heard. I think every, obviously everyone in the world likes to feel like they're being heard and that they are being seen. You know, we don't want to feel invisible. And so I think it's important to try and have that true collaboration with partnerships and having that transparency with parents so that they do feel like they are seen and heard when a parent is saying, but this is what I'm seeing, you know, with my child. And, you know, that goes to also the fact that they're, I mean, working in, in, um, the public sector where most of us are not afraid of talking to people or calling people on the phone or initiating the conversation. But I promise you there's probably 70% of the parents do not feel comfortable doing that. So we have to try and help break those barriers down so that they feel comfortable um, having that conversation. I had a, um, a Latino man reach out to me and he apologized for his not speaking really good English. And he also apologized for contacting me. And I was like, you have no reason to apologize. This is your right to contact me. And, you know, you, you should have these conversations. So I think it's, it's kind of um, up to us to try and break down some of those barriers. Um, you know, and then just understanding and rec recognizing different perspectives. I'm, I really believe that um, people's perspectives radically change um, a lot of the situations. And if you just could go into most situations, realizing that whoever you're talking to has a, a perspective that you can't even, you know, quantify. I always use my own two sons as a, um, a definition of this, because I have two sons who are only three and a half years apart, and they were raised in the same household. And I was the primary caretaker we were like the three musketeers. We hung out together. We did everything. We, you know, they did the Taekwondo and the movies and the soccer and all the things. And we had conversations in the car and very close with my boys. They are literally black and white. They are the most different kids that you've ever seen. And when you talk to those two boys and you ask them about their childhood, <laughs> you'd think that they, one grew up in a different country. <laughs> you know, they, they don't even remember their childhood together the same. I mean, it's so bizarre how different their perspective is. And so, and considering the fact that there's actual data on the, the fact that people, when they have a memory, they only truly remember 50% of it accurately. And every time you remember that memory, you alter it just a bit with your own flavor. How in the world <laughs> we even function as a, you know, humans to communicate effectively is kind of a miracle. So I feel like if we go into some of these conversations, realizing that uh, these parents and children, and I mean, and not even the parents and children are on the same page, right? They don't even have the same perspective. So trying to realize that they have a very different uh, viewpoint about some things. Um, it's super, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. But I would say the most important thing as a um, director of a 650 kid school K through 12 for nine years is that as long as the parent knows that you really love and care about their child, that you genuinely care about their child, that makes the most headway. And so that's the last thing I'm going to say. And after vomiting for several minutes, <laughs> I would love to hear any feedback that you all have about your positions and what you see as things that I could possibly help with. Um, I forgot to mention, I am a, a, a very unique position. So I am a direct report to the board. So I am not, I'm not necessarily under this superintendency. I'm a direct report to the board like um, internal audit is. And so I have a very, uh, I'm sort of on my own island <laughs> and literally. <laughs> so I don't have a team. I don't have 
you know, um, a bunch of people that I work with, I'm kind of just like out there. But the thing is, is that I do get to speak to a lot of uh, people about this and in real meaningful ways. So any information you give me is extremely important. And I would very much value your opinions and your feedback on what you see would be helpful for you. And that's all. Thank you, Cassie. I appreciate that others are word vomiters also. So thank you for that. But yeah, feel free to come off mute, friends. Add comments to the chat. We've got plenty of time here to, to take some uh, feedback or questions. Yeah, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have that in anything that I didn't cover. It's a lot of stuff, just... I'm sort of like the canary in the coal mine. I I see a lot of overarching things and trends just because of the, you know, the complaints that come in. So, and I don't know, this might be of interest. The top three complaints um, that we have come in, um, number one is special education, which is obviously going to be probably number one be just because it's inherent in the nature of special education and then um, the second one is <laughs> coaching <laughs> so coaches yeah sports coaches <laughs> I know that sounds kind of uh, funny and then um, the third one is bullying so those are the top three uh, complaints that we have come in Cassie, a lot of the, the folks here work with um, foster parents, kinship parents, um, mm -hmm. along those lines. Is there anything that you've seen uh, in your experience that would be helpful for us as we communicate with caregivers that are um, not necessarily the biological parents? I think that that's um, sort of an untapped area, in all honesty, because I think people have this perception and I mean, I have talked to some parents in that situation, you know, some foster parents and it's, it's hard because I feel like a lot of people have this perception that it's a temporary thing. And oftentimes it's not, you know, some of those kids will stay in foster those same foster homes for a very long time. So I think that is something that I would love to, um, there are some things, you know, that I don't have on the um, parent portal page. And that would be one of those things that I think would be really helpful. However, uh, there's not a lot of talk about it. Do you know what I mean? There's just not a lot of conversation going on about it. And so I think that would be something that would be very helpful, especially getting some feedback from people who are working in that uh, framework. So yeah, and this is that group, right? So and I, I think that would be really helpful to have some kind of guidance or understanding of what the challenges are from folks that that are like here of what are the yeah. challenges we face with foster parents, with kinship parents and um, and have a resource for for people to be able to go to. So. And there's um, got to be some research. I mean, I haven't run across a ton of it, but there's got to be some uh, some extensive research on it somewhere because um, there's so much of this parent engagement framework that has happened in, you know, areas that are super metropolitan in like inner city Chicago and some of these areas where you know that that is something that they are encountering nonstop. Do does anyone here have specific concerns that you would love for me? I would be more than happy to do research on that and provide resources for that. At least try and find out, you know, like what, what is the current um, data? I, it, and it is sad to me because I think some of these things like this, they're, they're sort of forgotten populations, yet they're huge. <laughs> and it affects the kids in big ways. Could I jump in? This is Susie Estrada, and I forgot my computer hey, at home. I'm at USB, but I'm sitting in the parking <laughs> lot and meeting on my phone. Um, and we'll probably have to commute back home. So that's how my day is going. 
Uh, <laughs> but I think something that would be really helpful for foster parents, and it's something that came up um, at one of our charter schools. So I oversee the Indicator 8 Parent Involvement Survey, and we were getting really low um, participation with the survey. And one of the common misunderstandings was that word parent. Who is the parent? If I am the grandma, if I'm, you know, so-and-so, not biological parent, this survey isn't for me. Am I allowed to complete it? Uh, so something that we've really uh, honed in on this year, and we did see an increase in that response rate, was clarifying for families the legal definition of parent. So we use parent, but when we uh, use it, it encompasses guardians, it encompasses caregivers. So we created a quick graphic that outlined that for folks. Um, and I can send that over to Amanda. Uh, it might need some revision, but it, it cites like the code and rule where that is. Um, and you could share that with your families as well so that they know whenever you see parent, it's not just the biological parent. It's the person who is the guardian. It's the person who's the caregiver. Um, and I think that it, at least with this survey, right, uh, we went from 22 percent response rate to 27 in one year. Um, it's really just getting that message of across of, yes, the legal word that you see is parent, but legally we do define it as all of these things. So it's not uh, leaving folks out. Uh, so just creating that understanding of who who this means, because it can be confusing and um, and can leave people out if we're not clarifying that parent is more than just the biological, um, you know person that gave birth. They might not even have custody anymore. So it's a very complicated area. Thank you for the work that you do. We went into a lot of um, situations with grandparents and um, caregivers, you know, where the child is, and it's not even a um, legal guardianship, you know, but they have the child in their possession for a period of time. So I do run into that a lot. And it is very confusing for parents, because if they try to dive into state code, um, it always says, you know, parent or guardian. And so they don't know, you know, how to navigate some of that. So I do think that uh, Susie's right in that, like that is um, a huge concern, because if you can't even, you know, if you don't even know where you fit in that picture, how do you, how do you navigate the situation? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's even so much more to that than, right, all of these mentors here have, I mean, hundreds of kids that we're serving, and each one has a, a unique situation, Yeah. Um, right, whether it's they're with kinship, or they're with foster parent, or they were placed with someone who doesn't have um, um, status, um, legal status here in the state, and now there's some issues with that happening right now, I don't know if you guys are running into that. Um, so there's just so many unique nuances with the families that this population is serving that um, that it's nice to know, Cassie, that you exist and that Susie exists, mm -hmm. right? So as we're yeah. navigating some of those things, it's it's good to know that you're there to help us maybe get through some of that. Yeah, and honestly, that that's where I spend most of my time, you know, is because whatever does come into me, it's always a unique situation. People are just like, I don't know. I mean, the ones that are easier is like, how do I pull my kid out for homeschooling, you know, and that's easy. But if you don't know a lot of even it's, you know, it's hard for me because I, I have to go through all of state code. Uh, and sometimes it's not listed in state code. That's the right. I, I mean, it's not listed in the education component of state code necessarily. It could be listed, you know, somewhere else. And so it's like, it takes a while to do that research, but uh, I feel like it's super important to do that because I, that is part of the, the rights, you know, of, and that's why I don't necessarily love the name parent liaison because I feel like it is a family and the family is really a definition that doesn't even necessarily dictate that they are, you know, um, biologically related. It could be even friends that have taken this child in and are trying to do their best with the child. So trying to figure out some of those and, and granted the legality of it does become sometimes sticky or whatever, but that can always be, you know, figured out. But I do think it's important to not, to, I mean, it is what's in the best interest of the child. You got to do what's in the best interest of the child, regardless of 
you know, some of these um, crazy things, the situations that we find ourselves in. So I'm more than happy to help with that anytime. You guys are more than welcome to reach out and I will definitely dig into whatever I can find. And I always, every time something like that happens, it's good, you know, because then I find, oh, there's a gap there. I need to figure out this and this is a real thing. And there are a lot of people that are dealing with this. And so then I can create resources for that. I, I kind of like support to do that. Happy. So I think that's a fantastic way we can work together. Continue the conversation. Um, yeah, in the chat, sure. we have a question about how to bridge a gap between foster care, excuse me, foster parents and teachers when we're getting to know the students. Do you have some suggestions there? Um, you know what? I always think it's good. I mean, it depends on the the foster parents and but I think I, and I don't know where because I've never been in the situation with a foster child. Right. But well, I take that back. We did have a foster child living in my home for a while. But like, do you do you um, is there an in-depth because I'm very pro student, right? Pro pro child. And I always feel like sometimes in education, we leave the child out. <laughs> Everyone's making the decisions around the child and and then no one asks the child. Do you, is there a, um, a really good process for that child that happens with the foster parent? And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but like a formal process even of, you know, like true truly trying to get to know the child you know like do you know the child and what their you know likes and dislikes are you know do they do they get to really know that child so that they can convey that to the teacher because I feel like unless the foster parent knows the child um, pretty well then it's really hard to convey and for them to act on the behalf of the child with the teacher and I mean, sometimes that, and I think that conversation, obviously it goes back to that building that relationship with the teacher and having that ongoing back and forth conversation with the teacher that's more frequent than a parent teacher conference. It has to be sort of a best practice. And I would dare say it would be good to create sort of a mini framework for the the teacher and the, and, and this goes to any child and parent, right? Um, that framework of how do you create these relationships that are ongoing and um, a continual conversation, not just these little check-ins. Do you know what I'm saying? Something that is an ongoing um, conversation that's back and forth. That's one of the keys that you see in almost all successful parent engagement frameworks is that there's this back and forth. It's not one-way conversation. I think we've been having the one-way conversations for decades. It's not, we've, teachers have done a great job saying, this is what I'm seeing, or this is, you know, and even, even like, this is what I've seen in your child, but there's not always that reciprocation from the parent. And I think we have to really encourage that back and forth conversation. Yeah, like that's exactly that last comment, like having that, you know. Um, yeah, Susie said a process to orient the foster parent to the school and the student like a, like a, and granted, there's a lot of frameworks out there for building welcoming, you know, and inclusiveness. Um, I don't know that it always gets done. And I think home visits are very much encouraged if we could live in an ideal world. I think, especially for foster children, home visits would be the thing to do. That would be the thing to do. But if that's not going to be done, then there needs to be some sort of a framework in place to initiate those conversations. Because you can't do a home visit necessarily if you have a parent that's on shift work, you know, and is working um, during the day and sleeping. You know what I'm saying? or I mean, working during the night and sleeping during the day, it's almost impossible to do some of those things. So I think we need to, like I said, we have to be adaptable. We have to figure out how to customize for these families. No. Let's see. It looks like our, so actually it's in one of the school districts that doesn't allow home visits. So do you have any yeah. 
alternative suggestions when you can't be that's i really i really really do believe in the the contact the the scheduled contacts i think that there's so much research on the success of teachers if i could really if it's it's I'm not going to lie. It's hard for secondary. Right. And honestly, those are the ones that in foster, that would be the most difficult anyway. I, my degree is actually secondary ed. And so, um, I think that the elementary it's easier to do with, cause you have, you know, 25 to 30 kids. Let's hope that's all. <laughs> Sometimes it's higher than that, but trying to make a regular communication. I think that is almost more important than anything that you do for that child is if you can sit down and a lot of leaders that are trying to push good parent engagement have created policies and procedures so that there is time set aside each week for that teacher to reach out to the parents. And so um, teachers who have been implementing this successfully, they will reach out like they'll say, okay, every um, day or whatever, I'm going to try and connect with, you know, three parents or something. Or on Fridays, the the leadership sets aside time. It's worth its weight in gold because it is sort of like a, a proactive way of um, nipping a lot of problems in the, the butt before they happen, you know, so trying to have that constant communication and two, it just makes the family feel like you really care for you to reach out. And it makes the child feel like a million bucks because if your teacher is calling and saying, hey, this is what I saw. This is a great thing that this child did. And not always. We're, we're so good about contacting when they do something wrong. But when do we contact when they do something right? That doesn't happen. And so in my school, we really tried to encourage every time you talk to the parent, you know, try to reiterate two things that they've done great or three things that they've done great to one thing that needs improvement and try and go at the other thing as an improvement, you know, not as your child is and don't attach it to the child as this is a bad behavior on the child. So I mean, this is a bad part of the child, but more as a behavior or something that we're just trying to improve. So I think there's a lot of different ways that we could go out that. And I would love to, and that's one of the things I would love to do, because I don't know that, you know, it's going to be climbing Mount Everest to try and get all of the superintendents to get, to buy into, hey, you should really create um, an effective parent engagement um, system in your, in your district. That is a huge mountain to climb. However, I do think that we can, and I have been in the process of going through the research um, and trying to create something that's basic and working with some of the other districts that are already doing this. Like how can a teacher, just a teacher, because what if you have a teacher in a district all by themselves and they're just trying to do this on their own? How do you get them to be able to have some really good framework to move forward? And so at least it's happening, you know, on even if it has to start there, I think that would be really great. And I think that's totally conducive to foster. And you can um, try to create frameworks for specifically for that. But like I said, if you see specific things that you run into that are hurdles that are specific to foster care, you know, like, you know, just like uh, Julia was saying, not knowing, you know, like, what can we do? What can't we do? Because we're in this weird nebulous pay place. We're taking care of the child. That's a huge, huge issue. What other issues are you seeing that are specific to foster care that we can address in those situations? And man, I will talk to every single teacher. If, <laughs> if they want, I will like give them the little framework and I will have a conversation. I'll say, let's figure out how this can work for you and your classroom. Even if I have to do it one teacher at a time, I will do that. Can I share something? <laughs> it's okay. Hi, Julia. Yes. Well, um, just talking about what, what is happening with foster parents here, 
I would say that uh, the way that I work um, uh, at GD, uh, Jordan School District is that immediately as I get a student, I communicate with foster parents mostly and, and case workers to see how we can help. And if I, for example, get a student that I already have uh, some notification from the case worker about a behavior problem or something, I always communicate. First of all, I what I like to do is to go to the school, make uh, some appointments with counselors, psychologists of the principal, and after that, I communicate to the case worker and the foster parents, and I ask them and request them to be there present. So that way, it, it's my way to 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 put them, yeah. you know, in, in here with us. So after that, I'm always when I'm having a, 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 a an appointment with anybody at the school because I'm you know looking for help for, for this student or. Uh, to to he can succeed at the school. I always communicate with case worker and foster parents and say, hey, I'm meeting with this teacher. Um, I would love to have you here. Uh, or you know, mostly that is the way that I do get foster parents involved. I would say, you know what, um, our foster parents sometimes they are very busy and they 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 have job other than foster. Uh, um, foster this kid so uh, it's kind of hard sometimes but um, I have been very lucky I could I would say involving the foster parents and let um, okay sorry um, ask them to be uh, at the school present there yeah. And, and it's, it's the only way, you know, and uh, honestly, if I have to, um, the fa uh, family team meetings, they are a really good way to um, ask them to come to school with me, to involve them, to to make sure that they, they are um, involved on this um, uh, student, um, you know, case. So just so you know, I just wanted to let you know. No, I think that's great. I mean, the more you can do that, and two, it's it, um, it's so much better when you have all parties involved there to be heard. You know, because relaying of information, <laughs> it goes back to that conversation of you know the memory of fifty percent of it is changed every time you recall the memory, and so I think that um, you never know if you're relaying the important components that would be important to the the parent you know the foster parent or the caretaker and so I think that's super important to always do that so that's that's great practice I think I think that would be really good honestly it should be it should be the practice if you think about it you know to always try and include them or at least offer it to them because if you don't then you're just losing a bunch of stuff in communication Yes. In translation, in translation, basically. Yeah, and I try to before I I met with a consular, even if I have an appointment, I try to make a contact with the case worker and the foster parents and and know what we are going to talk at the meeting, what we cannot bring, mm -hmm. because sometimes the case worker they they don't want something to be say or something. That's why mm -hmm. if it's possible for me, if something that I cannot say because I'm the mentor only. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm a very important person, <laughs> but the thing is they are certain things that legally we cannot say. So I'm telling the case worker, you need to come with me. You need to say to this to the to the, the consulate or the psychologist. You know, we have to know uh, that uh, they are certain things that they ha have been said by the case worker or the foster parents too. That's why it's very important that they are there on the on on my uh, meetings. And yeah, that's that's a key, honestly. Yeah, and I I would say too, you know, it's super important in initially to try and um, you know knock barriers down, especially with when you have language barriers and things like that um, with parents so that they feel like they can trust you and that they can have those conversations. But at the same time, I think it is super important to realize that moving forward, you have to have some sort of a plan in place. You can't just wing it all the time. You know, you have to have some talking points that are very important and pertinent so that, because I do think that a lot of everyone's a human. And so things sometimes go awry. And so I do think that's just a, I don't know, maybe that's just something that you know, makes sense to me because, you know, when you've been a teacher, you have a plan in place because you have to be ready for all of the situations that will go awry. But 
you know, having some talking points, these are the things that are super important to cover, but also, you know, taking the parents and the student for that matter, you know, like, what is it that you need to address? What, what are the things that you are finding? Cause they may go to a meeting and just say, we didn't fix anything. You know, like, mm-hmm. I don't feel like we, we got to the crux of anything. I do feel like that happens with a lot of parents, the complaints I get, that's why I get the complaints mm-hmm. is ultimately they're just like, I'm trying so hard to get from A to B, but I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm walking in sludge, you know? So that's one of their things. We're going through this process, but we're not ever making headway. So I do think that that's super important, but I do think it's important to identify what is it that they think is important so that you can incorporate that with their own, you know what I mean? With what you need, because mm-hmm. there are some things that you guys have to go through, but then there's things that they are going, I get this part, but I also need this. So they have needs too. So I think that's important. And the thing is, uh, uh, we have to understand that usually when we have a foster kid, we need to have the two part of the two histories, the, the student and the, and the parents. That's why I need to meet with all of them before we go to the school and meet with anybody, even if I have, you know, already an appointment with counselor or psychologist or the, or the principal or the teacher, anybody at the school. I do yeah. sit first with my foster uh, parents and my caseworker just to make sure that when we go there, we know what we want. We need, uh, we, mm-hmm. we, we know what we are planning to, to, for these kids at the school and what we are requesting, you know, and um, I'm trying, even uh, you have to sometimes educate the foster parents and the caseworker because they don't know what they can be, um, you know, request at the school for this school. So we need to talk to them about, about you don't know, anything that they, they mm-hmm. don't know. That's my meeting for, you know, with yeah. these parents to just make sure that they know that when we are there, yeah. we are, we are mm-hmm. requesting whatever the kids need for, to succeed at the school. So yeah, it's, it's just a, just a really, you know, probably a, a lot of work, but it's worth yeah. it. At the it's, end. A, it's, it is such a nuanced conversation in all honesty. I think about that a lot. And I've said this to lots of people. I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the process that we forget what the end goal is and um, we get used to it, you know? So that we're like, I need, I know what I got to do. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And then you, you forget why, why are we doing this in the first place? And I really think we do get wrapped up sometimes in the process. I know this is kind of a weird tangent, but um, I was raised on a farm and I rode horses, you know, since I was little tiny, you can never ever get on a horse and teach it anything until it learns to trust you first and no and then you get on and you do it systemically and systematically this is how i'm you know i'm going to teach this and this and this right there's a process but talk about a language barrier you know like <laughs> the horse is not understanding what i am even doing like why are you putting this thing on my head why are you putting this thing on my back and then now you're putting this thing around my waist that is extremely uncomfortable and I'm supposed to like this, do you know, and he's 2000 pounds. So th- these are things that I think we have to think about that from lots of people. And then from when, from when I was a teacher and mostly, you know, those, <laughs> I always call them, I love the seventh and eighth and ninth graders. They're so crazy, you know, <laughs> they're just, they're, they're, they're going through that such a hard time and they're unique, but those kids they're like that horse, you know, they, they just are. And so they have those things of where they they've had things happen in their, their history and their background. And there are reasons for their behavior. They don't just do the things that they're doing for just because they're bad kids. My mom was on the state board for 13 years, I believe. And she was an educator, principal teacher. And she always said, there are no bad kids, you know? And so I, believe that and I just think it's our job to figure out you know and it is it's a lot of work like you said it's tons of work but it's so worth it in the end if you're willing to do that upfront work you will mitigate so many problems on the tail end not to mention you are doing the very best for that child you have that best child that child's best interest in in mind 
and and when you're saying that i that's what i'm always saying choose the words that you use because honestly saying yes. oh this is a difficult kid or this is a, no to me yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, to me w the words that we probably w fit a little more what is happening with our kids is they are the the, the kids that they struggle the most that's yeah my, uh, it's, they are struggling on life well and they're they, in they a are difficult not the difficult one. <laughs> Yeah, so no. And do you know how long a kid remembers those comments, you know, for someone to either give them praise yeah. or not praise? I mean, and how many times do they not hear the praise? They are just hearing, this is a bad kid. This is a bad kid. This is a bad kid. Yeah. This is a trouble yeah. kid. This is a trouble. He's trouble. And so I think it's super important for a kid to realize, no, I see you, you know, even though you have all this stuff and you have all these boundaries and barriers, I see you mm -hmm. and I care. And even though you are pushing everyone away right now. I'm still here, you know, I'm yeah. still here. So yeah. anyway, I think the more advocates that we can have, the better. And I know, and I'm, this is such a long time ago research because I used to um, do adult um, ed training for, you know, at-risk kids and stuff. And well, not just adult ed, but just any at-risk kid. But, you know, just the fact that there's the statistic, and I can't even remember the statistic, but it's something like 60% or something. If they just have one, adult human in their life that they feel like they can go to their suicide rate goes down by like i don't know scott probably knows <laughs> it's like by 60 percent or something it's crazy exactly. just that's all they need just one human one adult that they feel like they can go to and they need the adult because they the adult is societally the safe place right i mean that's why they need that adult it's not just a kid you know going to a kid as a kid they know the kid can't help them get through some of these things. So that's why they need that adult. And sometimes you guys are probably that adult, you know, that they, they know that they have that safe safety um, area with. So. I agree. I, I really appreciate, I mean, out of the mouth of an experienced mentor, Julieta is telling us, have a plan, have a, you know, something to talk about when you meet with them, items to address. I think that's so important. Ashley did add to the chat a question about a student-centered learning environment when the student's in their third placement and really not building any connections with adults. And I'm wondering if that looks like maybe a referral out to your school counselor or your school psych to help with some additional resources. That's probably what I would suggest in that case. Uh, Cassie, anything else you would add to that? No, um, those are the hard guys. That's yeah. the sad ones that it's just hard to navigate. But I think, you know, what, what I will say is, you know, just never quit trying. I mean, we all want to give up at some point, you know, but especially with kids, sometimes with adults, I quit trying. <laughs> but with kids, there's always hope, you know, there's always hope for them. And so I think doing whatever and just listening, you know, that's one of the things just, you know, try and listen and hear what the real you know, crux and need is the crux of the problem. So yeah, and then providing resources. There are things out there. That's the other thing is um, parents, sadly, they don't know what resources are out there. There's so many resources sometimes, and they have no idea that they're even out there. And that's, I'm trying, and I don't know, I don't even know, you know, like, I'm trying to find some of those resources, so that I can provide those to parents. Um you know, I, I mean, such unique situations, just had a, an older kid that is transitioning from um, high school to trying to be into the real world, but he's just not quite ready, you know, just not quite ready because he's on the spectrum and he has a lot of anxiety and it's like, what resources are out there? <laughs> and so it's like I'm going down into the deep hole. Okay, I'm going to try and find out resources for this kid. And so you just have to keep looking and keep, and like Carolyn says, keep advocating for the kid. So yeah, I agree. Okay. I appreciate you guys so much. And thank I'm you. Okay, so, thank you, Kelsey. I so appreciate you too. Friends. Um, if you didn't capture her email, just let me know. And I will, I will actually, I'll send it out as part of my follow-up and Cassie, I'm yeah, going to take it's on my two, screen. Perfect. I'm going to take the two websites you gave us and put that in my follow-up email as well. So you all will just have those direct hyperlinks, but share feedback, give us any specific questions we can help with. And I'm sure we'll invite Cassie and 
I didn't know Susie was going to sneak in. So Susie back <laughs> again as to, to continue the conversation. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. So and please, healthy. please feel, feel free to reach out with anything and I'd be glad to collaborate on anything. Wonderful. I appreciate you. We'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thank, All thank right. you. Now we will move on to our second presentation and Scott is with us. He's even got a tie on for us. I'm feeling pretty special. <laughs> have to tease him. I haven't seen him all summer. So nice to see you, Scott. You're welcome to take over sharing screens when you're ready. Awesome. I love that this conversation is being had because this is an easy one to just jump right into. Um, are you able to see my screen? Did I do that all right? I'm seeing you at the moment. Oh, and now we've lost you on mute. Let's see, did I push that? Oh. All right, how are we now? There we go, we are good to go. Mute and screens, good? Yep, you are perfect. Cool. Hey, so sometimes when I jump into a presentation, it's very formal and I feel like I'm going to just not go formal today. I'm wearing a tie. I have another presentation to do, but yes, this is for y'all. This isn't to be formal, but I can't help but listen to the tail end of that conversation. And I just want to start by, yeah, I got some initials next to my name and I do some work, but um, I'm going to speak, I think, a little bit from my experience being in the system. So I don't know how many people are aware of me and who I am, but I work for the uh, Office of Substance Use and Mental Health. I sit on the School Safety Center. I'm a liaison to the State Board of Education. I've spent over a decade working with some of the toughest cases in our state with residential treatment in the private sector and also did time with the JJYS youth and their programs. But I also spent time in the system myself. And I can tell you from Ashley's comment, what a great comment to start this, this conversation around. Yeah, we can always find a way especially when those students are on their third or fourth placement and they are looking for the help. I want to I want to maybe start by just a model that I have adopted that I was taught that worked for me as a child, as a kid in the system, but also as as an adult working with students is it's called the solid object model. And what that means is sometimes when kiddos are in crisis, they're looking for someone to reach out and lean into. And sometimes they push back and we know this, but in the same way that when you're falling down, you reach out for a solid object to brace your fall. That is the same thing that many times these kiddos are looking for in their lives. And they will test you and they will push to see if you are solid. Our role and our job, and I believe this to be the case, is to be that solid object and to be there in a way. And sometimes it's about timing and sometimes it's about a lot of other things, but our jobs and our responsibilities as we work as caregivers and uh, I'll say pro-social adults in the lives of children, that's our role. And that covers a lot of different professions, as certainly the role of the mentor. And I think it's an opportunity for us to get that right. Uh, we won't always get it right, but I appreciate that comment. I appreciate the conversation um, and Cassie, it sounds like you and I need to talk horses because I, I also have some horse stories and I think we could talk forever. So um, I have this presentation. Again, I'll try and keep it informal. This was a presentation that we uh, put together, uh, me and a member of our safety center, Jeremy Barnes from the Department of Public Safety. And we presented this at the National Association of School Resources, School Resource Officer uh, conference this year. And uh, we, we we called it relationship advice. And so if you're, <laughs> I will tell you, I think it's good advice for any relationship, but certainly within the context of embodying the role of a mentor, uh, this is hopefully going to be helpful and a, a good use of your time. I also probably won't go the full hour. I just want to let you know, I, I'll be a little bit concise and a little early. I want to leave a little bit of time for question and answer, answer and conversation, but I know you guys are are busy people too. So um, I always start or want to start with this idea of who we are as humans and just where the last conversation was kind of moving towards. As human beings, it's important to understand the work that we do and who we're working with, yes, but also ourselves. And I do have a background in, you know, clinical work and and behavioral um 
I guess you'd call it behavioral work. I, my undergrad's in psychology. My, my graduate is uh, uh, social work. And people are interesting. And we are interesting as human beings just in general. And we're complicated. I use the mind-body-spirit model just in general to discuss this and to understand who we are. Oftentimes when things are going well or maybe not well, we can think about that in our body in terms of our physical health. We can ask ourselves questions in these spaces of, you know, what's going right or what's not going so right. The conditions, spaces that we occupy, where we stand, I, I believe it's important to stand in beautiful places. I love getting out. I love getting in nature. Anyone that knows me, that's a big deal, right? But whether it's the conditions that we're standing in or the things we consume, the degree in which we connect with others or the challenges that we put our personal bodies in that growth stage, that exercise stage, all of that's important. It's all part of who we are as this human creature, this, this being that we are. And we can understand that through our body. We understand that physically. And when we can understand that physically, we can use that same thinking and that same concept to who we are intellectually and our mind. What spaces do we occupy? Do you find yourself ruminating or going doomed stay scrolling, you know, on social media? What is the space that you occupy? What are the things that you consume? How or do you challenge yourself cognitively? And to what degree do you connect? And that's all really important to understand, especially when we're working with students and we're working, even looking at ourselves and asking ourselves, how are we doing? Just check in. And we check in with students all the time and maybe they're not doing so well. These first few slides are a really great place to maybe ask some good questions. How are, how are you doing in this space? How are you doing in that space? So it's easy to understand the mind and the body it's not so easy to understand the spirit. It's very hard to uh, put your finger on this one. And, and sometimes we don't talk about this one enough, especially professionally. Um, I do want to recognize that it may be the most important part of a person. Um, in fact, my, uh, my brother-in-law, he, uh, he coaches for Division I football. And oftentimes, they have to make some really difficult decisions on who makes the team and who doesn't. And they look at, in fact, they refer to it as the war room. And so they're all sitting around the table and there's, you know, a hundred different recruits, only 50 of them are going to get scholarships. How do you make those decisions? And they look at their stats. They look at their, their performance, right? How fast are they? How much do they lift? How far do they throw? All of that's important. They ask, are they a smart kid? Do they have what it takes to get the grades, um, to uh, build the teammates around them, you know, to, to learn the plays on the field? Do they have the in intelligence to be here? And then if all the answers are yes, sometimes the decision on why a student is a good fit or not comes down to this. It comes down to what makes them tick? What is it that drives this student? When things are hard and they have to take that next step, whether that's physically or metaphorically or whatever, what do we know about this student? And I believe that is intertwined with who we are as a, as a, as a being, right? And I'm using the term spirit, use whatever term you want. Um, but I will say that there's definitely an internal piece. I, I talk about this on the terms of motivation. What motivates you? What are your personal whys? What are, what do you find within? And then there's also an external piece. And this is the inspiration piece. This is where we are externally driven and we are, there is something happening in this space for sure, where we get to benefit from those around us. I want to say as a mentor, I think this is where you're going to have your biggest bang for your buck. You're maybe not going to always motivate, but you can inspire. And I believe that when we build relationships, similar to that relationship of trust that Cassie was talking about with the horse, 
when we can build meaningful relationships, we have the opportunity to in inspire. And while you work with students, I know it's hard on us. I know it's hard, laborious work, and sometimes not very, not very rewarding, uh, and and not very thanked very often. Um, but I want you to know that when you show up and you punch in and you're there, it's going to mean something to them at some point. And we can't be in the habit of checking out. We can't be in the habit of being unwell ourselves. So we need to take care of ourselves as human beings in order to really understand and be impactful to those little human beings that we're trying to help along the way. Uh, there's objectives and I will, we'll just skip this slide, but I hope that's it. I hope that resonates with you all to some degree. And, um, and yeah, we can't, we can't do this human work unless we really understand who we are as human beings. I have a little bit of data. I love to start with data and talk to data as we're asking what's the right things to do. And so I'm going to shape the conversation around the SRO data, but the truth is it's around the mentor data. It's around any um trusted adult that has the ability to be impactful in a student's life and to cassie's point about the uh one trusted adult outside of their parents yes that is a huge protective factor we know that the reduction of suicide rates but also the increase in graduation rates the um positive things that happen in a student's life are very much in place when we increase protective factors in fact to speak really quickly on protective factors we can't always control the risk factors. We'll never live in a world where we're gonna have enough nerf edges on everything and, and we will eliminate all the bad things. In fact, I was having a conversation with a school psychologist the other day and I said, well, what's the number of, what's the number of adverse childhood experiences? What's the ACE score that's like the right number? And he said zero. And I said, I don't know if the number is zero. And certainly I don't wish adverse childhood experiences on any, any, anybody, but the truth is we do not get through this world unscathed. We will have problems and we know, and the research is there and there's a conference coming up that, that you guys can um, possibly learn more about this if you're interested, but post um, post traumatic growth and our resiliency and our ability to bounce back and get better and stronger from having worked through a difficult experience. These are, these are very, very important. So risk factors will always be there. They'll always have happen. We can't always control those, but what we can control are the protective factors. We can be the trusted adult and also say within schools and anybody working in schools, the other big one is you've got to create a space of belonging for those students. That is key, especially, especially the prickly pears, right? Those that aren't always easy to be inclusive. Sometimes you got to be a talent scout and you're looking for reasons to give positive feedback. But those key protective factors, we know that if they're in place, that, that, we, um, that students have a much better outcome when risk factors uh, happen in their lives. If risk factors happen in isolation without those key prote protective factors, that's when we have our worst outcomes. Relationships are important to us all. We know that relationships um, are important to our students. These, this is just some high-level data from our school climate survey on uh, six to, uh, grade 6 through 12 on what they report their SRO uh, relationship looking like. Most of them feel safe. Most of them feel that the goal of the SRO is to help them and that they can go to them for help. And again, when we talk about SROs and we start, sh and I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later, but we start asking what is the role of an SRO in schools? I would say 90% of their time is to act as an informal mentor. Yeah, there's gonna be other things that they do, but we, we need them to be beyond just a law enforcement and, and a, someone in the room that's there to um, keep checks and balances on students. When, when we start to define what it means to be a SRO in the state of Utah, and this is from the top down, we are talking about embracing this role of a mentor. And we can see SROs are generally doing a fairly good job. 
SROs uh, reporting on their relationship with students and parents. So these are the things that SROs are saying students are coming to them for, or parents are coming to them for. And it, and it shows a little bit of information and gives us a, a picture of what that relationship looks like from a data standpoint. And again, that bottom, uh, on the bottom of that graphic, it does say that many students go to them specifically just for mentoring. Uh, we do a lot of training. We see a lot of training um, coming into our state, and we found that the NASRO training has been really beneficial. We're seeing very high increase efficacy scores across our SROs. These trainings, by the way, um, would be appropriate for anyone to take that works with youth. Uh, there's an adolescent development and mental health uh, track that's that's really great. If you are interested and in those um uh, like I think it's a day and a half trainings or something that's in your area and you'd like to attend free of cost. Uh, our office is paying for these. We are pushing out this information and will be for the next year or so. I can definitely have my contact information. Get a hold of me if you're interested because these these have been some great trainings uh, that we're continuing to push in our state. And again, what it means to be an SRO in schools, it really is about being that trusted resource and that mentor. Of course, there's emergency response and other duties, but uh, this is this is the, the main thing. OK, so let, <clears throat> let me just um, kind of ask some questions or pose some questions around this idea of the roles that school play. Is school a risk or protective factor? And I think initially, if you're not thinking through it, you're like, of course, it's a protective factor. What is it or can it be or have you seen when it's not? We don't have in our society a coming of age for our youth in a similar way where in our culture, um, you know, um, bar mitzvah, for example, or I'm going to I don't speak Spanish, but quinceanera, maybe I think is maybe <laughs> close. OK, um, we really don't. However, graduating high school seems to be this marker. Either you make it or you don't. And the messages that are shared or given or interpreted, I guess, or maybe maybe directly or indirectly, is that if you don't make it, you're you're a failure. And we know that there's a consequence for not having a high school diploma, you're less likely to be em employed. You're less likely to have health insurance. You're going to earn less money. You engage in riskier behaviors, uh, greater involvement for the criminal justice system. We know this. And so it becomes that much more important to understand the key role that schools play, especially when it comes to keeping students in school. When appropriate, we, we can make or break a child's life, honestly, um, if we're not careful. And I think we do, we go to great lengths to try and make sure that we get this right. But um, this quote from uh, Dr. Savage here, schools make or break kids. They can be their safe havens or places they try to avoid. How we connect or how connected students perceive themselves to be to the adults and peers out of school can make all the difference in terms of their ability to succeed. This is where we're at across our state with graduation rates. You can see right there, state of Utah, not bad at 88%. What does that look like when it looks, when we go to 89% or what does that look like when it goes to 93? Um, those are real lives and students and many of the students that you're working with. And to make those differences, um, it's important. And I'll say it's a, uh, fulfilling and important work that you're engaged in. So I appreciate, appreciate you in this. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about human behavior. This is rooted in CBT. This is kind of fun to know, but just in general, why did the chicken cross the road? Who knows? We've heard this a thousand times, right? We've got funny answers and not so funny answers, um, but we definitely can agree that this chicken crossed the road, right? That is a behavior. When we are working with our students, oftentimes we are 
very much focused on the behaviors. We have to be, especially when those are problematic behaviors, right? We can all agree that the behavior is happening. But before there's a behavior, there is an internal response. There's something happening. Think of it almost like a conveyor belt, right? Something comes in before something goes out. So what is happening on their internal response mechanism? And also, before there's an internal response, we have this thing we call our environment. If you're in school, we can look at this as school climate, right, and culture, and we can talk about all the things that we need to do to focus on this space and to improve in this space. And there's more than just that. There's their home life. There's their social life. There's the to and from the neighborhood. There's all the things that are now even the virtual environment that they're in. There is an external piece that prompts an internal response that, uh, that oftentimes when understood, the behavior makes sense. This is, again, rooted in cognitive behavior therapy. And we can understand this from a number of different lenses. My belief is those thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs, that internal experience, this is where you can have as a mentor, when you're seen as credible, when, you're, when you put in that work, this is where you can have the biggest ability to shape our children. And I know that's the, you know, cliche shaping, shaping hearts and minds, right? But we are, we are, for lack of a better term, giving small little rudder taps along the way to try to help keep these kids on true north. And we do that really well when we are able to reach them in this space before the behavior and even after the behavior. One of the biggest things you can do is after a difficult uh, behavior situation to invest in that student at that point will pay dividends for you later on because it's not likely that that's their first one or their last one. But when we can do that and we can do that really, really well, we can find a way to slowly improve over time. That maybe that behavior wasn't as intense or they told you to only F off three times instead of 10, you know? I don't know what it is, but find a reason to invest in that even when the behaviors are difficult behaviors. And of course, we have resources. Sometimes it's very hard to understand and to... Um, come to terms with the conditions of our many of our students. And so the environmental factors of their lives, we have to account for, we have to support um, on a very basic level, with our ability to help connect families into services that they need in order to meet the bare minimum of, of housing and of food security and of safety in general. These are really, really important pieces. And I, and I know and I want to acknowledge the difficult situations that many of our families are in and the students are in across this state. As a mentor, your ability to acknowledge that, to find some sort of compassion, I'll say, empathy for the situation, solutions. Um, I remember working with a kid who would show up late all the time. And we had a, a check-in part of our day that was important starting our day was a check-in part. And when he really learned to trust us, he really began to ask us for those things that he really needed. And sometimes they weren't easy to hear. You know, his power was shut off last night. He could really use a, a, a place to charge his phone today while he's at school because that's why he was late. His, his alarm didn't go off. He doesn't have power at his house. Um, Again, it makes sense why it's late, right? That externalizing behavior, we all agree. It's not acceptable. We can't allow it. It's disrupted to his program. He's not going to further. But if we backtrack and we, un and we understand it, it, it begins to make sense. And we can begin to find solutions so that we can improve that behavior. Okay, sorry, I'm sidetracking. I don't think I really need to talk about the power of perception too much, um, at least not through the context of law enforcement, but I want you to know that perception matters. And I wanna look at it through the lens of our youth here and understanding what our youth are seeing. 
This was an interesting statistic that came up in my world probably a couple months ago. It was this idea of diverging happiness and where youth perspective is versus where the adult's perspective is. Specifically, adults that are, um, I think in this was, I think this was 60 years and older um, versus those that were 18 or 22, somewhere in that range and younger. Happiness, self-reported happiness level. Um, if you're older and you're in America, you think life's good. Things are good. Uh, you've probably wrapping up a career. You may have had uh, a pension. Um, lived at a time when growth and prosperity was happening. You could buy a house. A large percentage of people decided to have families. Probably took vacations. Two cars. Uh, send your kids to college, maybe. I don't know. But there was this push in our culture and our society over those decades that really helped propel a lot, that generation. And things are good. Even though things are, arguably, we could talk about all the bad things in general. Uh, what a great time to be alive, right? However, our youth aren't seeing this the same way that the adults in the room are seeing it. There is a lot going on. Uh, teen mental health crisis, we all know and we've heard about the teen mental health crisis. It continues to be the case. Uh, you've heard of uh, climate change? Well, the youth are paying attention to this as well, whether, it, whether you agree with it or not, whether you believe it or believe it in its cause or, or where it's coming from, whether it's human or not, either way, it's happening or at least it's perceived to be happening. Again, it doesn't even matter if it is, you see this. College tuition is out of control. Yeah, it is, it's tough. I'm pretty sure uh, it becomes unobtainable for many today to even think about going to college. Uh, Surgeon General has issued new advisory board about social media. Boy, this is a good one, right? We know the impact of social media and youth mental health. Communities face rising youth violence across the nation. I sit on the school safety center. My world is largely trying to tackle the school violence issues in our world. I graduated in 99, so that dates me for sure. And I remember Columbine happening as a student. But what I don't recall, because I graduated, um, but that I get reports from others, is how different schools changed almost overnight in their safety and the anxiety and the fear of the violence that continues to happen in our communities, yes, but also in our schools is very real and it does impact our youth. Fentanyl, that's a great one too, right? Now we know that you can't just go out on the weekend and drink with your buddies or, or do a little harm, harmless drugs. Nope, you can touch a drug or smell a, a drug or whatever and you're dead. And your friends are dead. This is the fentanyl crisis that is happening. Um, and I'm not advocating for youth engaging in those behaviors. But we do understand that this is a time in life where youth will experiment. Now, the stakes are that much higher, right? Why aren't teenagers driving anymore? Yeah, kids are putting off their license. I'll also, I didn't put this on the slide, but it's self-reported that one third of males under the age of 30 are still reporting as virgins, that they haven't began to engage in relationships of meaning and uh, pursued sexual, uh, sexual relationships, which is shocking compared to what that was like in the 80s or in the 90s or past generations. Um, Typical teenager behavior is kind of going away. Gen Z's feel the fear, the military job. Oh, by the way, World War III, yeah. So that's the thing. Who's going to pay that cost? Probably Social Security's going broke by 2035. High cost of uh, families. Why would we even have families anymore if we can't afford them, right? Okay, so sorry to paint such a bleak picture, but I think it's important to understand the perspective and the messaging whether these things are real or not, they are certainly playing out in the lives of our students.
they are certainly happening and we have to acknowledge this. I'm gonna wrap up here in just a little bit, but I wanna focus maybe more on some solutions. And this mentor piece that I will give you advice on, again, this comes from the work I do, it comes from um, the research, but also comes from what I believe to be and what I've seen to be and found to be uh, my personal experience as what works. And if you wanna get better um, and you wanna improve protective factors, I would start with your style. And what I mean by this is not necessarily your, your dress, right? Or how you approach, but even that can be important, right? How you work with students, that's important. How you present yourself. But this is some of the most robust research that we have around uh, this specifically was, is around parenting, right? But adult roles in a student's life. This is, um, I forget who did this research. I can't think about her name right now. Anyhow, it eludes me at this particular moment. But this is the idea of parenting styles. It applies to schools, it applies to, um, again, any trusted adult. But we want to avoid being in spaces or working in spaces in ways that aren't effective. You know what neglectful parenting looks like or permissive parenting looks like or authoritative parenting uh, looks like. And we know that the outcomes of those are less um, advantageous, less, less good than those that are <clears throat> receiving an authoritarian. Sorry, sorry, I always mess this wrong. Authoritative. So an authoritarian is more like, hey, you're going to do this. And if you're a mentor that's like, you got to get this done, great. Because that is true. You want to have high demands, but you also have to have high responsiveness, which means you have to give the praise. You have to acknowledge how great their effort was, even if they fell short. I will tell you, that's probably the biggest thing to help build a relationship is when you're experiencing failure together and you can acknowledge the value of that and, and spin that into... Um, a plus, you you will begin to develop that relationship. And that comes from a high demand, right? I don't want to set the bar too low for you, so it's easy. And I also don't want to set the bar too high for you where you can't achieve it. We need to find a sweet spot. And there will be expectations. And there is a high demand. And I am so grateful for you showing up and doing your best in this space today and acknowledging that whether you made it or you didn't, that is what we're talking about when we start framing your style and leaning towards an authoritative approach. Okay, I won't go over the other ones. Um, what's next? School connectedness. I already mentioned this. We need, to, we need to promote spaces. And as a mentor working in schools, finding that ability to 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 connect with not just peers and other teachers and ad other adults, but where, what other programs do you have? What does it feel like to be coming to school um, and, and to, to be there? We know that when a student believes that their peers and adults care about them, that they're included, we know that this translates to academic achievement, improved self-efficacy, Emotional regulation, overall behavioral profile of the entire school improves when we build school connectedness. We have lower levels of depression and we boost the positive self-perception. This is where even um, to the earlier comments about a trusted adult and suicide rates decreasing, connectedness. We as human beings want to connect. We're wired to connect. In fact, arguably, that's why we are the most dominant species on this planet. We're certainly not, certainly not the strongest. And I would argue maybe even not the smartest in, in many ways. Um, but we certainly know how to connect and we know how to do together what we can't do alone. That is a strength of ours. And when we feel isolated or that we don't belong, it is a tremendous wound. And we need to do our best to make sure that we can increase this protective factor because, I mean, if you're an adult, 
you're connected to your community. When you're a kid, your community is your school. That's so important. Last thing that I want to uh, highlight, and this is going to be just in general, but embodying this role of a mentor and being that trusted adult, that that is what you're being asked to do when you're working with youth. Um, if you're a teacher, if you're an SRO, a therapist, all of these things, you know, you're just that. But when we start reflecting back on the people that made the biggest changes in our lives, they were more than that. They were embodying the roles of a mentor. I won't go through these um, in in detail, but if I were to give you my mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, what you ought to do, express care, do it often, let them know, challenge their growth. Don't set the bar too low. Don't set it too high. Have your finger on the pulse of that. Provide that support. Be the support. Be that driving factor. Share your power with them. Do not take it from them. If you can avoid taking the power from them, the, the last thing we want to do is take it from them. Our role is to prepare them to do for themselves. And where power can be shared, please share it. It's not us doing it. We want them doing it. And they get the credit, not us. We want to expand their possibilities. This is where we get to be curious with them and help them understand that there's more than just what's happening right now. And especially when right now is super tough or when that right now isn't fulfilling, expanding those possibilities. Listen, and I do mean listen in a deep down active connection way. Um, not just listening for your charts or for your, for your own notes. Uh, Listen, and not just the words they're saying. Sometimes it's in between the words that they're saying. See hard things as opportunities. Empathy and compassion lead with those. I promise you those will pay dividends. You might need to be a talent scout, again, especially for the prickly the prickly ones. Um, those are the most rewarding, though. And be present. Be there. Be with them. Be, be well in a way where when you show up, that you can give of yourself because I can tell you that's the thing that's going to make the biggest difference at the end of the day. Uh, remember you're a part of this bigger solution. You're a part of this school community. You're a part of that, their path forward. Um, and I appreciate the time to share these ideas with you. And I hope there's something that you were able to take from this. I will leave my contact information and um Again, I think I mentioned a few training opportunities and different things that you can uh, follow up with me on if you're interested, and I'll happy be happy to share that information with you. So with that, Amanda, I'm going to wrap up again a little early, but I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. I appreciate that, Scott. I have not heard be a talent scout, so you have given me a new <laughs> thing that I will take with me to trainings. Um, I've seen Rita Pearson's Everybody Needs a Champion, so I've been the plus two conversation for a while, but I like the talent scout. That's a, that's a new one I will take with me, so thank you. Um, do you have a quick minute for Q&A, or do we need to wrap up and let you go, Scott? Um, I do need to head out in about five, so... If there is some q and I'd love to take some questions. Okay, so we have a couple minutes if anybody wants to come off mute. Um, Carolyn added into the chat for us that we're teaching them to self-advocate and, and reiterate what Scott said, and that is so important. We need to teach them what they're going to take with when they're not with us. All right, friends, anything you want to chat about, or shall we call it a morning? Well, I'm not seeing anybody come off mute or any new conversation. Adulting skills. Oh, yeah. I'm still working on those personally. <laughs> so I always appreciate these presentations for multiple reasons, I will say. So thank you for chiming in on the chat, everyone, today and, and, and the conversations with Cassie. I really appreciate it. So lovely to see all you guys again. It's been a long summer break without our webinars, and I'm happy to be back together. So thank you for the time this morning. And I will send a follow up with some of the links that Cassie and Scott have mentioned today. And I look forward to seeing you all again next month for the next webinar or, or for trainings before then. So take care and have a great afternoon. Thank you all.